Okay, so uh, is it time for an extreme makeover yet? <laughs> Did I hear somebody say whatever? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, we're still awake. All right. Okay, ten dollars. This is just to kind of help keep us on our toes and you know make sure we're tuned in here. We're listening to what's going on. We've got. Uh, Matthew Owens here is coming up uh, next. I want you all to give a big hand. And I uh, just want to say Matthew is a UCSB graduate. He also is a savvy local and out-of-state uh, investor. Uh, he will be speaking to us about due diligence. And some of this is uh, marked off I can't see. Uh, Matthew, let's see, economics, a BA in economics at UCSB, emphasis in accounting. Uh, 2000 specializes in real estate investments. I know he's good because he's out in Memphis with a bunch of properties. He's been through kind of what I've been through in Memphis. We had some actual uh, members in our group here that went into foreclosure on their property because they weren't being properly managed. I was in the same management company. I fired them and I've got mine on section eight. But Matthew's gonna tell you how to avoid these situations. He's good. So thank you, man. Awesome. money in real estate. <laughs> Who here thinks that if they would have done proper due diligence, they may not have lost as much money if, if they would have done it, done it correctly? You know, I, I see so many people buying property, sight unseen. Sorry, Dad. Oh, yeah. Throw you under the bus on this I one. <laughs> and, you know, due diligence is one of the most important things you can do whenever you're investing in any, any type of asset, any type of uh, investment vehicle, and whenever you're even starting a new business, doing anything. Real estate is a business, whether you're buying one property or you're buying you know, 20 or 100 properties. So keep that in mind as I go through the presentation, I'm going to teach you guys some of the things that I learned through my own mistakes. So, and I'll, I'll go over a little bit about me. Um, I, I'm, I purchased over 200 properties in the last five years. I'm purchasing about five to 10 properties a month right now. And um, I graduated from UC Santa Barbara. And uh, I'll just admit that it was fun. <laughs> Santa Barbara is an amazing place. So, and my primary experience is in, you know, mostly I worked at a couple CPA firms where what I would do is I would go in and I would help, in, help the companies uh, look, at their, look at their books, audit their books, find all the backup for every number that existed inside those different financial statements. I would also go into companies and find ways to help them mitigate fraud risk factors, find ways to increase their income while also reducing their tax liabilities and things like that. And I can tell you that the due diligence that goes into you know, accounting and backing up those numbers, it plays perfectly right into real estate. And so every single time you guys hear data or numbers or things like that, I encourage you guys to back that information up. Go, go look, look at it like an auditor. Look at it like you're trying to investigate a company to see if those numbers are right. And if those, uh, a lot of people use different projections and things like that. And you want to go through and say, you know, is that right for me in my own comfort level? So I, I use, and, and, and should, should I be investing in this investment in the first place? My real estate experience, I do a lot of real estate taxation. There's, I found there's very few CPAs that really, really understand um, the, the tax side and the right structuring and legal implications associated with real estate. And I think it's one of the most important things to start with is understanding that to protect yourself. But don't go open all these entities. A million attorneys will tell you, open an entity after entity after entity. You want to start making money first to pay for the cost of those entities. Don't go through and start you know, opening everything in the book. Um, I do a lot of loan consulting, residential and commercial uh, uh, investment analysis for investors. I go through and do a cash flow analysis. I do syndications. Does anybody understand what a syndication is? Okay, so a syndication is just like a pooling of investors' capital that's actually licensed through the SEC. So you, whenever you pool investors' capital together um, on, on one deal or even multiple deals, um, you want to be careful and make sure you license it and, and uh, do it correctly. I do a lot of education as well. So I run a couple of uh, investor groups called For Investors by Investors where what we do is we have roundtable discussions on real estate, no sales pitch allowed, strictly education-based um, information. And it's extremely successful just because of that, because it's education-based 
uh, information, you know, marketing and things like that, where we, we get 50 to 100 people going every single month. It's a lot of the same stuff uh, Dan does, education, bringing in educators that, that really teach about the different, you know, strategies associated with real estate investing. So what I do personally with my business is I buy and hold properties. I joint venture with investors. I buy multifamily properties. I invest in trust deeds. I do a lot of different types of strategies when investing, and I think it's important to diversify across, of the, across that realm. You know, Tony made a very, very good point. He, he likes notes, primarily because of some of the things that, things that you know, he was bringing up, you know, the tenants, the to toilets, the termites. I, I would not personally want to have someone that's retired needing that money for cash flow on a consistent basis necessarily invest in real estate where <clears throat> where it's out of the area or out of, you know, where it's going to take active management of that investment. Whenever you buy a property, whether you have management or not, it's going to take active, active management. Okay, in a note scenario, it's a monthly payment every single month. So if someone's, you know, elderly and, and trying to retire on this income, I may go that direction. But you also want to make sure that you're making above inflationary returns. Because if you're not making above inflationary returns, then that monthly payment you're getting slowly decreases in purchasing power every single time or you know as as inflation happens and the way the government's printing money nowadays you can all agree that inflation is upon us and it's going to continue that way and so a diversification between real estate and notes is very important because with inflation real estate typically rises while notes typically go through a, 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 you know your, your purchasing power goes down but you need to make sure you're getting above inflationary returns to, so that your purchasing power doesn't continue to decline significantly. Um, we do a lot of in-house education. I help people set up self-directed retirement accounts and get un understand that type of investment as well. One of the most powerful ways to invest is through your self-directed retirement account. Everything's tax-free until you take it out upon retirement. If you do the math, you know everybody kind of has an idea that tax rates may be higher in the future and so they get scared of putting their money in a retirement account that later on might be a higher tax rate. But if you do the math on the compounding effects of the returns that you're going to make inside your retirement account until you retire, the compounding effects are ridiculous. It's absolutely amazing how much more money you can make inside your retirement account because of those compounding effects and not having to pay the taxes in, in the meantime. Um, we do a lot of syndications and um, where we pool investors' capital together. We also do taxation, bookkeeping, um, legal and entity structuring, and things like that because it's all a big business. The whole thing, whether you're, like I said, whether you're buying one or 20 properties is a business, and this part is one of the most important aspects. I can tell you that bookkeeping and proper accounting and understanding your own financial situation is the backbone to real estate and investing across everything. Not just real estate, but, but everything. Your entire financial situation is, is going to be determined by how well you keep track of your own individual budgets, how, how much financial knowledge you guys can obtain, because it definitely wasn't taught to you in school. Nobody teaches that for some weird reason. I don't know why. But So let's talk about the problem. These old met investment methods that were taught to everybody, I'm going to say it, don't work. They do not work. This is why. This is what those retirement methods are producing. 1% of the retirees over the age of 65 are self-sustaining. The other 16% are still working, 31 on, on dependent on relatives, and 52 are dependent on charity. And that's because the big investment companies, the Fidelities, Schwab's, John Hancock, all these big companies like this, they control your education base because they control the media outlets in which you get your education. Money Magazine, I just saw an article the other day that said, new cash flow investment now, make 3% on your money. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And what, what else about this that is, is extremely concerning? Fees. Fees that are hidden from you, unlike you know, self-directed IRA companies, it's usually like one-time annual fee or something like that. But these things are extremely risky. If you, if you really know stocks and you're investing in it just like a full-time real estate investor would and really educated on it, then great. You can make a lot of money in stocks. But if you're not, if you're a normal investor investing in mutual funds and things like that, it, personally, and I hate to say this, this is one of the dumbest investments to make. And the only reason 
I mean, my parents, I know so many, like 99% of the population invest in these things. And mutual funds, stocks, all these things can go down to nothing. You have no control over what happens with the overall investment. You know, there's stop losses and stocks and things like that that can help you, but the vast majority of people don't ever implement those things. It's extremely important to understand that control is the number one thing that's going to make you wealthier or send you to the poorhouse. Because through economic volatility and fluctuation, that control is everything. That's why I love real estate. I love investing in stocks. I will not put my money anywhere that doesn't have collateral back to it. Another asset or investing in an asset that has a higher amount of collateral than what I invested personally in the first place. So, I mean, in CDs, I don't know if you guys know this, but it, it just amazes me that you know inflation rate is not 3% right now. It's actually 8 or higher. The government changed it in 1982 to value inflation in a different way. If you valued it the same way they did in 1988, it'd be 8% right now. It's pretty amazing the, the little tricks that happen, you know? So be careful what information is out there and look at the media sources online that you know are not, not being paid by big business and these big investment companies when you're getting your real estate and financial information. So what's the goal? Is to cover all of these expenses, including your savings, by cash flow. So if you have six thousand dollars a month in expenses, you need ten grand a month or more in cash flow to not only cover all of your living expenses, but to reinvest the difference to continue your growth and keep up with inflation. Because what happens over time is your expenses go up and your cash flow doesn't. You have a big problem. And so you want to always have additional funds to continue to reinvest and continue to grow that wealth over time. Passive income is the goal. And I can tell you, talking from someone who works 70 hours a week, I, I work towards 70 hours a week working towards acquiring assets that are going to make me money whether I'm making money or not versus trading my time for money all the time. Okay? So and the way you do that is to invest in those types of investments and assets that produce passive cash flow. So trustees and promissory notes, rental property, businesses is the number one way to in increase your cash flow. Find, you know, people try to save money all the time and cut costs. It's so much easier to find new ways of making money than to cut your cable bill off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or cut your little tiny expenses that are gonna save you 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month. You know how easy it would be to go spend your time making an extra 100 bucks a month? <laughs> There's a million ways to make money. Annuities, dividends, and you can do it all inside of a self-directed retirement account. Does anybody understand this structure already here? Can I get a show of hands if you guys understand this? Okay, so we do have some people in the room that don't. So basically, you can have a self-directed retirement account, which basically is the same thing as something you have in Fidelity, but with less fees and they're up front. <laughs> and you can actually invest it in whatever you want, other than life insurance and collectibles and some, some items like that. And you basically come in and you have your current IRA or your 401k and you roll it right into a self-directed one. It's the same type of company as you know a normal Fidelity account and things like that. And these have been around for 30 years, but there's a big lack of education about them because the big investment companies aren't going to teach you about them because they don't want you to know. They want you investing in the stuff that they provide. And so you can set up an LLC that is owned by your IRA and have a bank account for that LLC and all your money from the IRA goes into the LLC and you're the manager of that LLC. Now you can't commingle the funds, you gotta be really careful not to commingle and do business with lineal descendants, parents or kids, you can do business with brothers and sisters and everybody else pretty much. But lineal descendants you can do business with. Now, you have a checkbook, you can write checks right for your assets. And all those assets are owned by this LLC and all the income is basically going back into the IRA tax free. It's a very, very powerful tool to utilize. You can do this right inside of the regular custodian account and things like that as well. So let's, you know, we talk about the power of compound interest, but nobody really understands the differences between getting a higher rate of return and getting a, a lower rate of return like a CD or something like that, and what that really does for you. And so if we took $50,000 now and contributed a normal $20,000 a year into an account, um, like, a, like a 401k account and an IRA combined each year, at the end of 30 years, you're going to have about 7 million versus in a CD, you're going to have about a million, a little more than a million. 
So, and this is just the principal balance. And this is a property at 12%, a trust deed at 8%, and a CD at 3%, okay? Now, let's look at the cash flow. When I show you the cash flow, think about what you need to actually retire on um, to be able to cover your expenses. And so you're looking at a property of $69,000 per month in cash flow versus about $3,000 per month in cash flow. Now in 30 years, do you think this is gonna cover anywhere near this? <laughs> Not even close, you can't even live on it now. And so investing in the, the traditional safe investments actually locks in your money to lose because you're losing purchasing power. So that's why I say it's one of the dumbest best investments you can make and you know, I still have people, even though I tell them the philosophies behind this, that they just they just can't deal with it. They have to go with what they've been what they've learned traditionally, and it's the wrong information. And it's to make those big investment companies rich, not you. I'm telling you, if I could borrow money at three percent all day, I'd be the richest person on the planet right now. It's it's ridiculous, <laughs> and I'll, and it's absolutely amazing the different things that have been taught to us over the over a period of time that has been drilled into our heads since birth. So let's talk about the due diligence and the team members that you need before investing in real estate or any other asset. You need to make sure that that homework is done right. The first thing, whenever you're looking at investment property, is looking at the neighborhood. Do not buy in the hood, okay? <laughs> you will lose your money. I'm telling you right now, I've lost a ton of money because I'm like, wow, that's a cheap property. I'm gonna buy that for five grand, 10 grand. I'm gonna go put 15 grand into it and it's gonna rent for 700 or 600 bucks a month and it's gonna be great. You know, I, I invest in Memphis, Tennessee, so you know, it's a little bit different price points than Santa Barbara. <laughs> so, but the cash flow is better and the numbers look great on paper until you have find additional vandalism, additional theft, additional tenant turnover, tenants not paying on time. We've rehabbed the property, re-rehabbed the property three times while the neighbors came in and stole everything, every time, in the hood. But people don't realize this, and they go buy it because it looks cheap on paper, because they think it's in a, you know, they think it's, it's something that, oh, I can't go wrong because it's so cheap. But that's not true, it's all relative. Market value analysis. If you're getting financing in a property in this market, it's extremely important to understand your market value, because you will not be able to get financing if, you're, if your market value doesn't come in right. And there's a ton of properties that there's foreclosures, there's a lot of bank owned properties and things like that in, the, in different areas where there are no comparable sales. But there's nothing but foreclosures in different areas. You wanna be really careful to make sure you get a financeable property. And if you're investing, that market value is your collateral. So you wanna look at that from a safety concern. I invest for cash flow and I look at the market value as my collateral and, and my exit strategy implementation. Um, also, on, on one, one quick note on market value, typically appraisers, when they're appraising your property, they want to see a minimum of three, to, three comps that they're going to use and three backup comps that they're going to use to um, appraise your property. And you want to make sure that those comps are available when you're purchasing, especially if you're getting financing. Make sure those things, and it has to be within a mile of the property within the last six months as well. Sometimes they'll go a little further if there's no comps, but keep that stuff in mind whenever you're acquiring assets. Rental analysis, you want to know what it's going to rent for. You can ask different property management companies. You can go look at call different signs in the area. You can go through and look online, which is you know a real quick and dirty way of doing it. But really, the management companies in the area are really going to help you guys the most in understanding your rental values. Renovation analysis, get a room by room, item by item approach to this thing. Even though sometimes it can look like it's, it's the contractor can love that sometimes when you're like, oh, I wanted you to break it down in little details and put a cost for each thing. They're like, great. Normally I combine that all together and, and make, make less money. So, but look at those items. Make sure you get a detailed analysis and get an inspection on that property so you fully understand all of the tools going into it. And make sure your major stuff is done. Your roof, plumbing, electrical, all that kind of stuff that can kill you later, you know, and cost you, you know, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to re-implement should be done, that preventative maintenance, you want to get done beforehand because you want a, a running asset the entire time without, without major problems happening to it. Closing document review, this happened previously. A lot of times you heard about the stories about people getting taken advantage of on their closing documents, people getting charged 
you know, huge points on their properties and on their loans and things like that. There's also a lot of little profit centers in there for other for lenders and title companies. So you want to know what's negotiable and what's not negotiable on those things. It does not cost hundred dollars to pull your credit report. It's like ten dollars or fifteen dollars for a tri-merge credit report. It's really quick and simple. Cash flow analysis and return on investment analysis. Very, very important. And in your cash flow analysis, you want to go through and include a vacancy, repairs allowance, property management. You, even if it's 10 blocks away from you, honestly, you don't want to get a call at 2 in the morning about a toilet and you really don't want to manage your own property. So I always include a property management you know, fee in there. Um, property taxes, insurance, and take those repairs and vacancy allowances and put them into a reserve account every single month. You want to have a reserve for every property that you're investing in so that you actually are prepared because things happen with real estate. You can get repairs that happen. People can destroy a unit. There's, you know, even if you do proper criminal and background checks on tenants, they can destroy your property. So you want to be really careful. You have insurance for that type of thing as well. You know, vandalism insurance and things like that, but be very, very careful. Insurance coverage. What things are covered? You know, when you go buy a property and it's unrenovated and you're going to go renovate it, you should be buying a vacancy policy, not a renter's policy. Because if you go buy a renter's policy and something happens to that contractor, you're not going to be covered. The insurance company is going to come in and say, no, we're not going to go cover that because you have the wrong policy. You know, there's things in the insurance like loss of rents coverage. You know, if there's a, a, a fire or something like that and the tenant has to move out, the insurance company will cover your loss of rents during that period of time. There's things like that that you want to know about, and the different implications and, and you know, what coverages do you have. Property management is the key to your real estate investment. If you don't have proper property management, you lost your money already. The property management, I don't care if it's in Beverly Hills <laughs> or Santa Barbara, <laughs> it's, it's honestly one of, the, one of the most important things that you can have is that proper management company that does the proper communication with you on you know every single month and that you can communicate with and that you know does collection procedures right, does eviction procedures right, goes through and makes sure the asset is, is taken care of and protected. So interviewing that management company is very, very key. This is our due diligence package that we provide on every investment. We get the before and after rehab pictures, the video, inspection reports, the comps on the property, all of this stuff that I just went over, we put together personally. And I do this because I wouldn't want my, I don't buy it myself without putting this stuff together, let alone helping another investor invest in, 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 in real estate. I wouldn't want them to invest without doing their homework first. It's extremely important. Now let's talk about team members. Team members are, are really the key. And I talked about property management, but look at those contracts. There's managers out there that try to charge you a flat fee, whether it's rented or not not the best idea. There's no incentive for them to get it, get it rented. And then they try to throw in the contract that they have the exclusive right to sell your property afterwards. So you're sick of it, tired of it not being rented, and then they get to go sell it for you. But So look at these contracts in these ways and say, what is, what's in my best interest? What structure, from a business standpoint, is in my best interest to be able to make sure that they are on the same page with me and they're properly incentivized for performance. You want to look and see how much, uh, you know, what, call for references, see how much they know about the tenant landlord laws in that state. If they screw up and you, you get sued for, for not doing proper management procedures, that's a big problem. It can cost you a ton of money. Do they have markups on repairs? That's a very big, big no-no in my book because personally, I don't think that there's, there's a, that's a good incentive in place. If you That incentivizes more and more repairs to happen if they're making money every time there's a repair that happens. So look at those types of things. Um, you know, cheapest is not always the best either. We've, we've had managers at 6%. I went through five management companies in Tennessee before I just started my own and said, forget it, I'm doing it myself now. So I shipped one of my best friends out to Tennessee to manage all of our properties about six years ago. and. He's, we have five rehab crews now. We have a full in-house management company that manages it. I talk with them every day. And you know, we bought him a house for 200 grand. It's 3,000 square feet on an acre of land on a golf course. Oh and, and I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And the guy doesn't golf. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
why do you live on a golf course if you don't golf? So, I mean, those are the types of, you know, you see differences in different markets like that, but I mean, you know, I was, I was telling you guys earlier, you know, I mess with my friends now and tell them if they mess with me, I'm going to send them, send them to Memphis and make them live there instead of California. You know? <laughs> so it's better for taxes and no, no state income taxes. So um, teams of rehabbers, you want multiple teams of rehabbers because what happens is if you have one team, then their quality can slowly decline, their prices can incline, and their time parameters usually increase as well. So you want to be able to pull that work away from them if... If, if they're not doing their job and get contracts in place for these things so that that way they're incentivized you say hey look how much time do you think this is going to take you to rehab okay a month great I'll give you a month and a week after that period of time you're going to lose a hundred dollars a day in labor time until it's completed but if you get it done before that month for every day you're done beforehand you're going to get an extra hundred dollars a day too incentivize in incentivize incentivize all of your team members make sure you get materials and labor breakdown for all of your major items. Attorneys and CPAs. You want attorneys and CPAs in every market you do business in. Okay, I don't pretend like I know the laws in the state, the, the, the tax laws in the state of Arizona. I don't. I live in California. I'm a California CPA. Some of them, you know, are, are the same, but a lot of them are different. In, in As far as attorneys go, you want an eviction attorney, you want a closing attorney, you want a contract attorney, you want a ton of different attorneys that specialize in that specific area. I wouldn't go to my closing attorney and ask them to help me with an eviction. They don't know anything about eviction law. I mean, they have an idea, but they don't specialize in that. So those are the types of things you want to look out for. And CPAs, there's even CPAs that do, do business in different segments that you want to make sure you understand what do they specialize in. Brokers and bankers and private lenders. We went through about 35 different bankers and, and lenders before we found reliable team members that we can actually work together with. A lot of them will tell you different things and I, and I say bankers, bankers are usually a little bit more reliable only because they're a direct source to the money. You're not going to a secondary person. Uh, brokers have a lot of creativity. I'm not saying they can't be reliable, I'm saying that they're a secondary source to the money, but the, the brokers can shop your stuff around, get the best rates for you. They can even be creative, find the private money find those bridge loans for you that you need in that private financing for renovations and things like that that normal banks won't finance. Affiliates, very, very, very huge. People that can bring you property, people that can raise capital for you, people that can introduce you to relationships. Affiliates are huge, and how do you meet those? Through networking. I, I used to work at a CPA firm, and I can tell you that I never networked. I hated it. I'm like, I don't want to go make money for the CPA firm here. I'm not making any money off of it. It's just, eh, I don't want to do it. I started my own company. I quit my CPA firm job with 30 grand in my bank account and uh, real estate education that I had been investing a little bit before that. But that's all I had. My whole family is going, what are you, crazy? You're making a great living right now doing this. And I can tell you, I started networking afterwards, <laughs> like, or, or right around when I quit. My business just took off because of the networking and the relationships that are developed. Because it's not only finding about you know finding people that can help you, but how can you help everyone else? And what is everyone else doing to make money? Because there's so much opportunity out there. You can make money in tons of different ways. Insurance agents, make sure you have somebody that understands rent, uh, real estate and rental property. We fired a couple of those not knowing, not teaching us the right stuff. REO agents, go take them to lunch. Go, to, go be their best friend. Inspectors, selling agents, bird dogs, appraisers, all very integral parts of your team. All these guys are really, really important because you cannot do your business without these guys, without people that are reliable. And building your team is one of the hardest things you'll do because you'll go through multiple of all of these team members before you find the people that you really like, they're going to get your back, they know what they're doing. Okay? So let's talk about the math. Stuff I love. <laughs> If you have a property, for example, that is worth 100,000 and you buy it for 75, you got about 25 grand in equity. Now this is a typical property in Tennessee that's, you know, 2500 square feet, three bedroom, two bath. It's usually about 100 grand out there in the in the mid to higher end neighborhoods. You can buy them for 250, but you're not going to cash flow very well. So, you always want to include a vacancy. You have your rents minus vacancy minus management, taxes, insurance and repairs. 
And then you also, to compare it to other investments, you go through and take in the depreciation benefits when you're comparing other ben uh, investments to see what that thing is going to cash flow um, on a monthly basis. And so let's look at this. If you were to sell at 95% of the market value, so 95,000, and you had 7% in sales costs, you would make about 13,350 if you went and sold this property after three years. So in year one, you made cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, and equity. You made about 16% return on your money, all cash. You can go ahead and invest in one of these things and obviously put 20% down. You get the best rates with 25% down now versus 20%. There's a lot of strategies you can utilize to even do no money down deals. But I would say anybody who wants to do a no money down deal better have some reserves in their, in their, in their back pocket or they're not investing with me on any of that stuff. I learned my lessons in letting people invest without any reserves really quick. <laughs> so the, what about trust deed investments? So trust deeds are all about your collateral, just like what Tony was saying. Look how safe this is if your investment is 65000 when it's worth $100. You have a, a lot of equity. It's at sixty-five percent of the market value. Typically, I have investments where uh, I, I have investors invest with me at eight percent interest rate for seven years. It's a flat payment every month. It's not a hugely high rate of return or anything like that. But it's a very safe long-term investment, and it has collateral attached to it. But you know, I, I like it. I think it's a great return. And and compared to CD rates and things like that, it's amazing. So compared to 58% what Tony was talking about, it's nothing, obviously. So, but look at some of those things. When you buy a non-performing paper, you obviously make a higher return as well. So, so if you're looking at cash flow streams, you made an 8% average annual return, about 56% overall, but you get a set payment every single month, and it's always collateralized. What about joint ventures? I do a lot of joint ventures. My goal, if I didn't have to sell any properties, I do sell and I flip properties, but if I didn't have to, I wouldn't. The only reason I do it is to gain more capital so I can reinvest it in more cash flow. So I would rather do a joint venture with an investor where typically they're in it for about 65% of the market value and they get 75% of the cash flow and 75% of the profits for that joint venture. And we buy it and we hold it. And so year one, I'm saying the cash flow is 800 because we guarantee the renovation, we guarantee the tenancy of the property. Year two, year, it, it goes down a little bit from there, and I'll show you guys in year two some of those categories, but 75% of the cash flow is 600 a month or 7,200 a year. If we were to sell in three years after the, cost of the, after the person's investment is put back and sales costs, the investor gets about 17,500 in cash on a $65,000 investment. So if you do the math, Year one cash flow at 800 or 600 a month. Year two it went down because I included a vacancy and repairs allowance in the calculation. Year three we have the, the same cash flow from year two plus the proceeds. That's about an 18.7 percent average annual return on investment every year. And you're owning assets that appreciate with inflation. You know so that you can go invest in some notes with Tony on some of the non-performing notes, but also invest in real estate that is going to appreciate with with inflation and things like that as well to properly diversify. So but before you actually go and start looking at the math and you start looking at due diligence and what you should be doing on every property, you want to analyze the market that you're going to invest in. Okay? This, this type of analysis is very, very key because you want to go invest in a market like you know, Detroit possibly or something like that that has a very, very high unemployment rate. Or um, Nevada actually has a very, very high unemployment rate. Look at some of the economic indicators in those markets to determine what are the better markets that have less volatility, that, that are more certain during economic volatility times? So when I started investing, I did an analysis on a lot of the different markets across the U.S. And I found I really, really liked the Memphis market. And so I looked at the Memphis overall, and I also looked at the, the real estate picture of Memphis. So it's the 18th largest city and part of the 41st largest metro area with nearly 1.3 million residents. So it's not like some small little dinky town somewhere that could you know, evaporate to nothing. It has a diverse and growing economy with its primary industries in distribution, manufacturing, agribusiness, and healthcare. And it's known as America's distribution center. So FedEx has their headquarters there. And we're seeing a lot of companies moving closer to FedEx to have faster turnaround time on their product, lower shipping costs. And the government is actually giving them 
tax incentives to bring their manufacturing jobs to the Tennessee market. And so we see Nissan has, is there, Nike opened a plant there, Electrolux and Mitsubishi just got major tax breaks for, for starting to, to build manufacturing plants in Memphis. Specifically, the government over there is saying, bring your jobs here and we'll actually go through and, uh, and give you guys tax breaks. And this actually, this giant dome right here, has been vacant for years. It's right on the Mississippi River and they're actually making it the largest bass fishing outlet in the U.S. Right on the Mississippi River. Kind of cool. You know, a little different. Um, it has a growing bio research hub and is home to four Fortune 500 companies as well. So what about the, the Memphis real estate market? Aside from, from Corky's, we talked about earlier, and, and Elvis. My, my fiance loves Elvis. I just got engaged a couple weeks ago, so. Hey. It's been seven years, it's about time, you know, so. But um, I took her to, to Graceland. I'm so sick of going to Elvis's place. I take so many investors there. I'm just like, it's enough Elvis. <laughs> so, but the real estate market there, it has one of the highest rent to price ratios in the nation. So, you know, in, in Southern California, if you have a $400,000 house, it may rent for say $2,000 a month. So you have a 0.5% rent to price ratio. In Tennessee, you're looking at a house that has a market value of about 100, it rents for about $1,000 a month. So a 1% rent to price ratio. And what does that mean? It just means you're making more money on your money due to cash flow, okay, versus trying to hope that the property is going to go up in value over time. The PMI risk index ranked it as the third least likely metro area to depreciate in the next two years. A recent study by Moody'sEconomy.com ranked it as the sixth most undervalued city in the U.S. Um, average annual home price appreciation of 4% per year over the last 20 years, other than 08 through 11, which I'll share with you guys in a second. Over the past 20 years, it's only had two quarters in which home prices declined. So in the 90s when it crashed, it went down by about 2%. So you're looking at a really, really stable market when there's economic fluctuation, but you're making your money on cash flow first and slow, steady appreciation after that. In 2008 through 2011, during the largest U.S. crash on real estate, it only went down by 35 to 4.5%. So you're looking at getting built-in equity on every property, right? No one's going to buy property at market value. You're going to buy it under market so you have an exit strategy built in, okay? Very, very stable market. Here is actually the graph from 1985 to 2008. You can see in the 90s when it crashed, it went down by 2.5%, and on average about 4% appreciation each year. I don't know what happened in 1985-86. Wow. <laughs> I wish I was investing then. But born at 80, or 78, so wasn't really investing yet. <laughs> 42% Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, here is California, Tennessee, and the U.S. from 2001 through 2011, and you can see the crashes here. You can see California is a hugely volatile market. It goes up a lot during booms. It goes down a lot during busts, but you're not going to get a ton of cash flow in a California market. Your returns are not going to be as high due to cash flow. I invest cash flow first, appreciation second. I don't buy and hope, I buy and get cash flow and then hope it goes up. <laughs> so here's some ex investment examples that we do. This one produces a 34% cash on cash return. This one's already sold. Um, 4875 Wooddale, 1798 square feet, three bedroom, one and a half bath, rents for 975, it's worth 88,000 and we sold it for 70,400. The investor put $14,000 down and got a loan for 56000 So if you do the math, rents, vacancy, management, property taxes, insurance, repairs, you're looking at five ninety six a month in cash flow. So, and your monthly payment is only $320 a month at a 5.5% rate, which right now you're getting around 5, something like that, sometimes a little less, but it just depends on the bank and things like that. But, so you're making about $3,300 a year on your $14,000 investment, plus your tax benefits, your built-in equity, your principal reduction, that's always important, looking at where your principal reduction is as well. So if you bought this all cash, just based on cash flow, you make about an 11.18% return. If you bought it with the financing, you're making about a 34% return, excluding equity and excluding the, the um, depreciation benefits. Here's another one, 26% cash on cash return. So 16,008 down, there's a three bedroom, two bath, 1781 square feet, it rents for 1,000, it's worth 105. Not, not too bad of a house. You're still looking at a 382 a month payment. So if you actually, if it went vacant, 
You're not getting destroyed in monthly payments if this thing goes vacant. You can go through, and if you buy multiple investments, investment properties, you're going to have a cash flow from other investments that are going to offset a single vacancy or you know, even a couple vacancies if you buy a lot of properties. You know, Because these things go vacant every once in a while. Don't expect that they don't. People can stay there for 10 years or you know, three, four, five years, but expect them that every once in a while they go vacant. And that's when the repairs happen. That's when that reserve comes in play. So you want to make sure that you have that reserve set up. We also do seller financing, usually 50% down. We'll do you know 15-year amortization and seven-year balloon payments. Sometimes if they put a little bit more money down, we can do a 15-year fully amortized loan as well. Um, we can do that to self-directed retirement accounts, um, which is non-recourse loans to, to, to those. Uh, we also do note investing where you can make 8 to 10% on your money. So what do we do that's different? We have a qualified tenant which, with the proper criminal and financial background checks. We have fully turnkey, fully renovated properties with the preventative maintenance done. The plumbing, electrical, roof, H, HVAC, <coughs> all that stuff. Quality long-term assets. We don't buy in the hood. Don't ever do that, guys. I'm telling you, it's the scariest thing in the world. You know, I, I bought so many properties in the beginning, sight unseen, relying on my manager saying, oh yeah, I'll collect there, no problem. You know, and they, they just don't care. They, they just, you get bad management and you just don't want to be collecting that rent in those areas. Proper risk mitigation procedures in place. The proper due diligence done on every single investment. In-house management. A CPA running the company, which the reason why that's important is because I understand the proper communication that's needed for investors and I can help them understand their tax, their legal implications, their return on investment analysis, if it's hitting their specific goals for their own personal financial situation. So I sit down with my clients for an hour for free every single time I have a new client and I go through and sometimes even they don't, they don't invest and I don't even have a problem with that. I sit down with pretty much anybody for free and I go over their own individual financial situation and try to tackle what their goals are and try to help them in any way I can. I don't mind meeting with people because it comes back to you. It's all karma. If you help someone else, they're going to come back and help you in some way 20 years from now. It doesn't matter. How you can make money with us? You can invest in trust deeds. You can buy and hold properties either through seller financing, traditional financing, or cash. You can partner with us on joint ventures. You can make 2K a property referring clients to us, but you know if you're not a realtor or, or agent, you, you know, you're going to have to have some additional services. You may have to pay you for <laughs> internet marketing. <laughs> Syndicated investments. And you know a lot of people don't necessarily know or fit into these categories, and that's great. That's no problem. If you want to come down and sit, sit with me, I'll talk with you guys about it and see what resources you don't even know you have. Time is a very, very valuable resource. So that time, whenever you want to make money and you're just new or not sure how to proceed, comes, you know, that time you, is hugely valuable because you know I work 70 hours a week. I'm sure everybody else, all these other guys in the room do the same thing, work really, really hard for their investments. So bringing resources and being an affiliate, you can make a ton of money doing that kind of stuff. Bottom line, we help you make money and we make money when you make money. And I have a favorite quote by Robert Kiyosaki, one part of me is a hardcore capitalist who loves the idea of money making money. The other side is a socially responsible teacher who's deeply concerned with the lack of financial intelligence among society as a whole. And it's because people do not teach financial intel intelligence in school. People don't know how to balance their checkbook. They don't understand interest. They don't understand putting a budget together every single month. You know, I, I can almost guarantee, and I won't make you raise hands, but you know, 90% of the people in the room probably have not done their personal budget in a while <laughs> and, and really tracked how much am I really spending. You know, I think I spend 400 or 500 bucks a month in spending every month, you know, just on miscellaneous stuff, but it's probably more like a grand. You know, you know people really don't realize how much you spend. Mint.com, by the way, is one of the best ways to start tracking your expenses if you guys don't know about it. They have apps on your phones, it's pretty great. So what are your next steps for financial success? And that's not with me, but for yourself. Develop a strategic financial plan for yourself, which includes assessing your current financial situation, your assets, liabilities, and income and expenses. You can't know where you're trying to get to unless you know this first, because you can't put a plan together unless you know this first. Reduce your expenses, eh, not too fun. Reduce taxes, huge, self-directed IRA investing, educating yourself on different tax implications, 
you know, and, and how, to, how to mitigate taxes and the different structures to use for tax mitigation. Set up the right legal structures for increase your income. Start an eBay business, anything to increase your income. It's one of the best ways to really increase your financial situation. Set financial and life goals for yourself, which is having a clearly defined aim and a specific goal that you think about all the time. I can't tell you how many times my fiance tells me to shut up about real estate because I can't stop thinking about it. Because it's like, I can get another deal done. I'm gonna do another one this month. And we're buying like 10 a month and I'm like, what about this apartment building now? What about this commercial building now? And I'm telling you, it's, it gets exciting when you're going, how much equity does that have? What, 100 grand in equity? All right, cool, I'm gonna get that one. It's gonna make me 100 grand. Have a burning desire for this achievement. You have to be thinking about it constantly. And this comes from Think and Grow Rich, if you guys haven't uh, thought of, if you guys haven't read that book, one of the most powerful books you guys can read. Get educated. Financial education is the key. Read and listen to audiobooks. And why is this important? It's important because through reading and listening to those audio tapes, I listened, I drove from, Santa, from Tor, or Redondo Beach all the way up here today to listen to a book called uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island. It's about the Federal Reserve. And I'm telling you, one of the most amazing eye-opening books you ever, you ever read or listen to. But these things train your mind to actually continue your education and empower you to take action on a consistent basis, and that's why these are important. You know, it's real hard to not be lazy and just take that back seat and watch TV for an hour, but if you're actually listening to these things every day, it really empowers you a lot to really take that action, which is the most important step in, in, in your success. Write down your affirmations, who you wanna, what you wanna do every single day, and read them every day and every night, and taking action is the most important thing, like I said, because you can know everything in the world and read all these books, but if you don't do anything, you just sit there and say, well, I, I tried to do that, but I tried to do one deal and it just didn't fall apart. It fell apart, so I just didn't keep going. That's, you're, you have to fail and keep going. Failure is, is the key to your success. I can tell you that. I've lost money on deals before, and I can tell you that I've never made that same mistake again. And, and I kept pushing forward. Connect with people with the same mindset. You want to mastermind with people because the wealthy, the middle class, and the poor, think differently and they talk about different things. So if you're constantly around millionaires and other people that make a ton of money, you're gonna be thinking about the same things they think about. You're gonna be talking about those things. You're gonna get educated on what's going on in the market, what's happening. You wanna constantly be thinking about that. Think, and I'm not saying dump your, your broke friends. Everybody has broke <laughs> friends. You know, I'm just saying start hanging around with the right types of people more often. Keep those friends. They're really good at emotional support. <laughs> so. Um, the more you achieve in your life, I really, really believe this, the more you achieve in your life, the more fulfilled you'll become and the happier you will be. I don't know about you guys, but to give you a simple example, if you go work out, which is really, really hard to do in the short term, you're extremely happy at the end of the day or after you've completed that. You're, you feel so fulfilled, you're happy that you, you, you got off your butt and you, made, you, you, know, you, you worked hard and did it. It's with everything in your life. You get rid of that short term, you know, discomfort, you, you fight through it, that short-term discomfort, and the harder it is up front, the more fulfilling you'll have, you'll, you'll be at the end. The, the, more, the happier you'll be, the, the, the more fulfilled you'll be, and, and you'll be a much more well-adjusted person because of you, you've been able to accomplish so much more in your life. Desire is the key, you have to want it. There's too many people that are complacent, that are just, you know, and I know so many people that are complacent and broke, and they're unhappy with their lives because they haven't achieved more. And that doesn't necessarily have to do with money. It has to do with anything you think is, is worthwhile in achieving. Whether it's going out and starting a nonprofit organization, making money, going to the gym, doing anything that you think is gonna be worth it in your lives to actually make a difference. This is very, very important. So that being said, that's it for the presentation, guys. I hope you guys liked it. If you guys wanna talk, I'll be over here afterwards. I think we're gonna have a break right now and everything. So, um, you know, you guys can come talk. To I've got one question for you, Matthew. Yes, sir. Uh, on your joint ventures. Yes. Are people going on the deed with you? Yes. Okay, so always secured by the property. If you're thinking about just buying a property someplace and finding a property manager, you know you need to go back and watch the video of him today on YouTube over and over and over, so you can really get what he's saying here today. <laughs> because I guarantee you. Those property managers will steal your property if you're not watching out. There are some people with integrity. 
But when somebody's on the deed with you, who's going to be making sure that that is going to work? That's a great investment. Yeah, and, and okay. you know, it, it's it's crazy that so many people don't get their money secured. You always want to secure your money. And honestly, this is a small bit of the overall due diligence presentation that I do. The other one's about four hours long. So it's really, really difficult to cover all that information in such a short period of time. I get into detail on all the different little items involved. And it's extremely important to understand those things over time. Yeah, so, so thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Appreciate that.